Asylum for the Insane, A History of the Kalamazoo State Hospital, presented by Dr. William Decker, Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. And this slide depicts um, a baseball diamond. And this baseball diamond was located directly uh, um, across the street from the mail department building. And um, the hospital team played what uh, I learned was teams from the Allied Paper Company, Louis Restaurant, and the uh, bankers team and many other teams around the city. I grew up in Kalamazoo. In fact, I lived uh, just a short distance from the hospital. I lived on Axtell Street. And I used to go up the uh, hill uh, uh, at the end of Axtell Street and up uh, onto the um, baseball diamond and watch the teams play baseball there. And uh, this is the famous uh, brick water tower that was um, completed in 1896. Uh, that supplied the water for uh, bathing, drinking, uh, the laundry, and uh, fire protection until it was uh, replaced for that use uh, by a steel uh, water tower that sits to the south and west of uh, this uh, tower. This tower still has the uh, two large tanks of water in it and uh, the water is available if needed in an emergency for fire protection, but that's the only purpose it serves now. There are some interesting myths about the, the water tower. Uh, one of them, of course, that I'm uh, very fascinated by is the one that uh, I allegedly allowed um, Elvis Presley <laughs> 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 Well, there's a lot of snickering there, so you probably know about the story. Well, anyway, the story was that um, uh, Elvis Presley had been sighted here in Kalamazoo. And I received a call, and I'm not going to say who or from what agency, but it was from a news agency, inquiring if it was true that Elvis Presley was housed in this tower. <laughs> I played into the story for a while and said yes. I, I had come into agreement with him that, uh, with an understanding that he could live in the tower. <laughs> <laughs> but he could only exit at night. <laughs> and he had to use the tunnel under the grounds that uh, leads to the uh, west entrance to the quadrangle. <laughs> Actually, they had to be back in uh, before daylight. Well, uh, finally, I had to call the news agency and tell them that that really wasn't true. <laughs> but there was also uh, interesting visitors would come, and uh, uh, you know, they'd always be a little suspicious and uh, hesitant to tell me what their fantasies were about that tower. <laughs> and so I uh, liked to feed into those fantasies from time to time for a while. And I told them, yes, we have armed guards up there. And of course, that fit in beautifully with their fantasy that there were machine guns up there and that we housed our worst patients in that <coughs> tower. Usually I had to, uh, before or, uh, dismissing them, uh, correct them and tell them that it was a farce. Um, again, going back to the matter of overcrowding, uh, the, uh, there was never enough room. There was always a demand uh, for... Uh, the admission of more uh, patients. Uh, the legislature, de uh, legislature decided that it would not build any more of these large uh, asylum, asylums, that it was too expensive, that they could uh, build uh, cottages out on the farmland at about one-tenth the cost of uh, the large buildings on the um, asylum ground proper. So they set about uh, to set up uh, farms, uh, colonies. The first farm colony, this is not the first farm colony, the first farm colony was built out on Douglas Avenue and was referred to as a, a Brook Farm Colony. It, uh, as you may know, uh, extended from Mosel Avenue 
and uh, then east, uh, they, they bought about 156 acres at that time and extended east toward Northwest e uh, West Beach Avenue, uh, but uh, not quite that far. Later on, they were able to purchase uh, several hundred more acres of land, and they did extend uh, the uh, farm property to uh, Westage, North Westage, and across Douglas Avenue up uh, along Barney Road. Today, uh, all of those buildings are gone save one. There is still one building out there, and uh, that uh, is now occupied by the Douglas Avenue Market. And uh, that building, at, uh, when the, the hospital operated it, was a building to house uh, horses and cows. It's operated by Kent Fisher. He owns uh, about uh, 100 acres of land out there, and so you don't see any development on that parcel of land uh, that's adjacent to Douglas Avenue and Mosel Avenue. And that's why, because he owns all of that land, he's not interested in, uh, in developing it. Uh, the legislature and the hospital uh, wanted uh, at least uh, a minimum of 600 acres, but that amount of land was not available. So uh, a few years later, they were able to buy uh, 324 acres of land uh, on Parkview, that bordered on uh, Parkview, and, and uh, that included most of Asylum Lake at that time. And uh, this is uh, uh, one of the first cottages that was built out there. This is uh, known, uh, was known first as Grosvenor Cottage. It was a cottage built for 27 uh, female patients and their attendants. The physician who was assigned to care for the patients out at the farm at that time also had residence in, those, in that home. And uh, we don't have time for me at this, uh, at this point to go into some of the interesting stories, particularly about the physician. You read it in my book. Um, and uh, they actually built, uh, built uh, four residences uh, for women out at what was known as Colony Farm, also uh, known as Oak, uh, uh, Oak uh, Farm, uh, because of the large stand of oak trees out there. This uh, is a picture of a Mitchell Cottage that was built out there. This is a, a three-story structure and was uh, built to uh, house 78 uh, female uh, patients. The Colony Farm uh, on the um, east side of Drake Road had uh, uh, Palmer Cottage, Mitchell Cottage, Rich Cottage, Grosvenor Cottage, which the uh, name was later changed to Van Dusen, uh, all for female patients. On the west side, there was one large cottage uh, built, Pratt Cottage, uh, which uh, was built for uh, male patients, and we'll see that in a moment. And this is Pratt Cottage. Along with the, uh, well, I could go back just a little bit, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, at that time, all the doctors and those uh, employees who cared for patients, provided direct care to patients, lived in the buildings that housed patients. This was Pratt Cottage, and this was a residence of uh, many of the employees serving the uh, male patients. Um, and you can see, obviously, here, there's some of the employees here. There's a young baby here. I don't think uh, a, uh, she's here this evening, but there was a, a lady that um, I interviewed for this uh, book, and uh, she, her family lived in Pratt Cottage uh, when she was born. She grew up there, lived there until she was 17 years old when the family moved to uh, Goebbels. Pratt Cottage uh, sustained a fire in 1929 and uh, had some damage to the roof structure. Uh, they re uh, repaired that and then put on a large uh, extension so that the uh, building would contain uh, well over 200 patients. Um, 